welcome to our time. This is Janice and I'm Malcolm and boy do we have an action packed show with fascinating people for you to meet today. We, do, we always have and today Peter is talking to... Oh he's not interesting. <laughs> but <laughs> talking both. about gifting money to your children if you can Absolutely and would like right. to. And we also have Brian Gilbertson on the show, who is a fantastic opera singer. And also the pageant king. He has the uh, <laughs> best job in the world. And Dolly Lee's performing for us. But right now, here's Pete. Peter. Thanks, Janice and Malcolm. I'm Peter Seller. Next on Our Time, we're going to talk about something called gifting. Now, anyone can give away any of their assets, their cash to another person, but there can be some financial pitfalls. And to discuss this and other issues, I've got Human Services Department uh, Information Services Officer Daryl Bampton joining me. Daryl, how are you? I'm very good, thank you, Peter. And thanks for having me to come and talk about gifting. Now, um, before we get on to that, of course, there's, uh, your service covers a lot more than just gifting, which we'll get to in a second. It certainly does. Yes. Tell us about <clears throat> what people should do if they worry about their financial situation. You're the first port of call? Well, we can be a, a first port of call. Uh, what the government does is provides a free financial information service. And all around Australia, uh, there are financial information service offices located in most of the Department of Human Services or Centrelink offices. And we talk to people about matters financial. It's an information education service. We're not there to give advice. Uh, and what I say is, um, look, if you have a, a change in your circumstances that has a financial implication, maybe give us uh, a, a hoy and we can give you some free information so that you're better placed to make better financial decisions yes, for today up on the screen or now. for your future. So yeah. gifting, a lot of people probably wouldn't be aware that, you know, oh, I've got a few thousand, I've got a car, a house, a boat, yeah. I want to give to little Johnny, my nephew or something like that and, and aren't aware of the possible pitfalls. So firstly, technically, what is gifting? Well, gifting is really, as, as the name suggests, mm. you're, you're giving things away. Mm. Uh, you're no longer having ownership of them, you're transferring ownership to somebody else. Uh, and what we look at is um, whether that means you've deprived yourself of the use of your assets. Mm. Um, so as far as um, income support goes, so if you're claiming a pension or an allowance, mm. uh, it'll be your entitlements will be based on what your means are, what income you have, what assets you have. Um, and whilst people can do what they like with their assets, there's an expectation that they use them for their benefit. So if you uh, yeah, deprive looking, yourself... Looking at your website there, this is all, oh, yes, all that detail. Oh yes, that's up there now, that's good. So it's a good place to go, um, humanservices.gov.au mm. is our website. and uh, just do a search for gifting yep. and there's some information there about that but if you uh, if you uh, divest yourself of your assets without getting adequate consideration uh, then the gifting rules come into play and there might be some penalty as a result of that. I was going to say a lot of people wouldn't uh, think anything of this, wouldn't even know about this because that's, uh, that's they true. Just simply don't bother or they haven't, it hasn't been told to them. But what about the uh, the value? I mean, is, is there a cap on how much you can give somebody? Well, um, getting back to it, you can do what you like with your assets. Mm. Government can't tell you what mm. to do, what not to do. But with that expectation that you use your assets for you, the, the gifting thresholds are that in any financial year, Mm. Uh, the gifting threshold is $10,000. So whether you're a single person or a member of a couple, it's $10,000 for one or $10,000 for a couple. And as I say to people, it's not $10,000 per grandkid. That's the, the cap for the, the financial year. And, and in any rolling five financial year period, uh, the cap is uh, $30,000. Mm. So if you exceed either of those thresholds, then the amount that you've exceeded it by uh, will still be assessed as though it's your asset for a five year period. Right. After five years it disappears. So what about, uh, I was going to say, what about the, how is it assessed? I mean, do you, do you physically go in and say, well, you've got X dollars in the bank, you've got your house, you've got the... Oh, well, when we look at <coughs> assessing uh, means testing for, to work out somebody's entitlement mm. to income support, we look at the value of assets, but mm. we go on the net market value, so people will tell us what their assets are worth. Some assets count, some assets don't, like your home doesn't count mm. for uh, means testing purposes. Right. But if you've got a, an asset that was, say, worth um, $50,000, and you've given that to your kids, for argument's sake, so it might be $50,000 worth of cash. Mm. Uh, we'll say, all right, well, the gifting rules are your first 10, okay, the bit above that, in this case, 40,000, we're still gonna say is your asset under the assets test for a, a five year period. So gifting, where gifting hasn't occurred, is there some, uh, some scenario there as well that you need um, to be aware of? Or? Oh, yep, yeah. it, it all depends on whether uh, it's determined that you've got adequate consideration. Mm. So mm. if you if you transfer something and in return you get something of equal value, then there's no gifting. Uh, and a, a case that's quite common is uh, people might transfer assets. Quite often it's their family home. 
uh, and quite often it's to the kids. Uh, and in return, they get a right to live there or remain there for their time. This is one example. And we'll say generally that's a fair exchange. Uh, and that comes under a broader way if we look at assessing uh, what we call granny flat rights. So where somebody transfers assets in return for a right to live in a private residence for their time. There's some detail up there on the screen as well. Like granny flats, yes. So how often does this gifting occur? Is this something that, that takes up a large part of your, your job? Oh, I spend a fair bit of time talking to people about gifting hmm. because uh, firstly there's that potential impact on, on the asset mm. test, but realistically, if you're affected under the asset test and you make a gift, then your assets are actually going to go down by $10,000, which is the free area, mm. so you might actually end up getting a little bit more pension out of it if you're assessed under the asset test. But we also look at it under the income test, so we treat an excess gift or a deprived asset as a financial asset, just like money in the bank, mm. and we deem income on it under our deeming rules. So it might be that you've turned an asset that had no accessible income held against it, into one that does, so mm. there may be an impact under the income testing side of things. Well, a lot of people, I guess, wouldn't wouldn't uh, even dream that the government would be involved in this. So it's my money, I just give it to Joe and Fred yeah, and well, Harry and whatever. Is there a penalty uh, if they're unaware of all this detail that we're talking about now? Is there a penalty? I mean, well, do you jump on these people or just say, oh, hang on, you well, probably didn't know about this? Well, there's no there's no real penalty per no. se, other than we will continue to assess it right. for five years. But uh, the retrospective question we ask at the time people make claim for income support is have you done any of this in the last five years? Okay. Have you given anything away or have you sold anything for less than market value? Yeah. Um, and we will ask for details. So for argument's sake, if, if you're claiming the pension and four years ago you gave the kids mm. a holiday house, mm. Mm. then there might be another year that we're going to assess the excess gift portion of that. Oh, okay, so what, yeah. what about, uh, we mentioned, uh, I've read uh, deprived income, what does that, do we touch on that? Okay, well I've been talking about assets. Yes. Uh, but there are situations where you might um, give away income. Mm. And now, the thing with the assets that you give away, any deprivation assessment mm. is only going to be for five years. Mm -hmm. If you're assessed as having foregone or given away or deprived yourself of income, mm. we'll assess that indefinitely. Okay. Um, and in my, all my years of this role, I've seen I haven't seen any cases where we've, we've spoken about gifting income. Plenty of gifting of assets. Mm. Um, but an example might be you might be on a super pension mm. and your indexation means that you're going to get an extra $1,000 a year, let's say. Mm -hmm. And you might choose, no, I don't want that because I don't want it to interfere with my pension mm. assessment. We're going to assess it anyway. Right. Yeah. So it's something that people weren't uh, really uh, aware of. This is an ideal time to perhaps contact uh, someone like yourself. There's some uh, numbers there, and the, the website is obviously got oh, every detail, every yep. conceivable detail. <coughs> That's right. Well, the Financial Information Service, you just do a search for FIS, mm. FIS, Financial Information mm. Service, and the Human Services website, and uh, that gives you information about our service. Also gives you information about our seminar program. So the visual you've got up here is, is uh, takes you to where our seminars are. We run information seminars across the country in the evenings on a whole range of topics, um, income streams, superannuation, aged care fees, investing, uh, looking after your assets, uh, age pension and how it works, uh, amongst many, many other titles. So we're keen to talk to as many people as possible uh, and that's the way to get into the website, have a look at uh, what you can do and come and see us well, Darryl, for you've, free. You've given me some great information. I'm sure all our viewers uh, have learned something from your chat with me today and, and hopefully they'll so contact too, yeah. you or, or someone like you if they're in doubt about any of this. Gifting. Absolutely. Thanks Darryl. Nice to, nice to have you with us. Pleasure. Thank you. No worries. Welcome back to our time. You know, for a long time, I've been wanting to have our next guest on our program because he has such a fascinating life story. Some of you may know Brian Gilbertson, but for those who don't, hello, Brian. How are you, Malcolm? But for those who don't, Brian is a fantastic singer, opera singer, um, commercial pop singer, and he has the job that almost everybody in the world envies. But let's talk about the singing before we talk about the job that everybody envies. <laughs> Brian, where did you start singing? Oh, look, I think my first memory of it was lying on the laundry floor and humming and I felt all this incredible vibration through the oh, body. Okay. Then I started singing at school, so in primary school. That school was it, was it a school's program? 
no, 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 just singing to the girls and I've got a couple of kisses behind the church and I thought, well, there's something Excellent. in this. Excellent. <laughs> <place. laughs> kissed behind the but, church. Uh, I've never thought of that Yeah, before. I think it was the Murphy twins, in fact. But uh, anyhow, oh, okay. it went on yeah. and then I, then I eventually uh, sang at school and Talent Quest and things like that. And then a, a young chap called Vincent Plush was at school and he ended up working with the ABC and um, a composer, very modern composer. And through... Um, uh, Anthony Roberts and Maria Tomasetti with the uh, Bunyip Theatre. We all was, did that. Yeah, well, you've yes. done some wonderful work out there with the young fellas, uh, and they did it in their, in their day. And um, so that gave me the opportunity to no, do it. No, but the I worked with them too. That's, oh, did you? Yes, really? yes, oh, okay. Absolutely. Well, there you go. Yeah, was, so um, what a great thing. Again, you see, when you're a young actor, it's very hard to find work. It doesn't matter where you live in Australia, it's very hard wherever you live. And here in Adelaide, there wasn't that much opportunity. No. There were very few professional companies, and Barnip Children's Theatre was one of them. Exactly, and there wasn't a lot in the schools. You know, you no. Didn't, it's, you know, learning to sing, learning to dance, and all that sort of stuff didn't happen in the schools. <laughs> You've just reminded <laughs> me of a funny story, and I'm sorry, I have to tell you. Um, the very first show I ever did with Marie Tomasetti, um, the rehearsals were in a house without a roof. <laughs> so when it rained, and it did, because we were, they, I mean, it was a, it, with great respect to them, but it was a string bag company in a way, in the sense that there was no budget for anything. So there was a vacant house. So yeah, that's a good place to rehearse. You won't be disturbed from the outside. Only when it rains. Only when it rains. And did you have anything glamorous to rehearse in? Uh, well, yeah, we've, re we've rehearsed in some really weird places. I think <laughs> I, I agree. You found the space you could get. But I think uh, when we did it with Maria Tomasetti, um, it was the Golden Vanity and it was through school. And oh, okay, uh, yes. we did it at St Cecilia's Hall yes. at uh, St Aloysius oh, okay. College. Yep. And so we're in there. Um, but that was a great experience. Oh, a, and great, course, a great learning experience, yeah. wasn't it? Because you just had to work through everything. Yeah, and it was Benjamin Britten. So I think that taught me not to be scared of music because uh, Benjamin Britten's not easy to sing, but nobody told me it was difficult. So yes. I just sang it. How, what good advice to somebody, though? Don't tell them it's hard. Just go for it. Oh, look, I think the best thing is to say that there is, there is no wrong or right way to sing. It's just experience. You, you experience changes in your voice. You look for freedom in the voice. Um, I, I've seen too many teachers of young children tell them that they're wrong or they're too loud or they're too soft. Uh, that means you can find the singer and at a very early age that has an effect on them when they're in their teens and when they're in their 20s. Mm. So the more limiting you are in terms of your advice to uh, children, that shuts them down later. I think that has an effect on older people too because quite often people have said to me, I would love to have sung. I said, well, why don't you? Everyone can sing. Oh, no, 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 I've got a terrible voice. I'm tone deaf. I'm... Blah, blah, blah. But in my experience, I've only ever met one single soul in my whole world of teaching and all the stuff that I've done in my life that was truly tone deaf, who could not really hear the note. Yeah. And I, I, What's look, your I, experience been in that area? My experience is that um, quite often when, when you get them distracted, so I'll quite often test out their tone deafness by throwing balls to them. Okay. So I'll have two balls and I'll throw one to them and they have to throw it back at the same time and then I get them to sing. Okay. So I'll just sing a little tune for them and then they'll throw the balls back and then they'll sing the tune. More often than not, they sing the tune in tune. In tune, yeah. Because they're distracted. So that teaches me that this particular person tries too hard to get the notes accurately and therefore shifts them off. They're not actually That's receiving true, yes. the information and processing it. They're actually rushing forward to try and make sure that they do it correctly. Because it should be a joyous feeling. It should be. And the thing is that our, our whole education system is about getting ticks. You get the star of the day, you get gold ticks. It's always a tick. When you're trying to change your voice to improve to something else, you're not looking for the 18 that you got out of, you're not looking for the 18 20, yeah. out of 20 and saying, oh, how I've got to go and fix the two. What you're doing is you're saying, what, were the, what was the one thing that I got that was improved? Yes. And let me focus on that and let all of those things that Because perhaps... that will suck everything else into it eventually. Yeah, you don't you'll... want to go, try and fix your errors. Mm. You'll be doing it forever. Yes. You want to pay attention to the wonderful things that, that you can do. That are, that are really improving. And the tone in a person's voice is unique to them. It's unique to them, so don't, you know, a young singer, um, follow, follow the wonderful singers that you love and, and may aspire to be, but remember that those singers 
um, were once like you and they became themselves as singers. Now the reason you're saying this of course is you've just done a workshop as part of the Fringe Festival here I in did. South Australia but that's because you've been a well-respected uh, performer and opera singer virtually all your life. So what are the highlights for you? Or what um, have been the highlights? I suppose I'll, I'll tell you the things that immediately come to mind. So the first one was my first opera in Europe where I was an Australian ex-rock singer who transformed into this opera singer, standing on the side of a stage about to go on and thinking, why in the hell am I here? <laughs> uh, when I'd been directed by a Hungarian who spoke no English, oh, the good. stage manager was French who spoke no English, so we had interpreters all over the place and there I was, this Australian rock singer, singing opera. I gained a lot of comfort in knowing that Peter Hoffmann, who's a great operatic singer, was also a rock singer. Uh, in Europe. So, you know, the cross-gendering of that is okay. Um, then I suppose more recently singing in the first ring cycle that, that was here in Australia. That must have been something amazing. That was uh, unbelievable. Um, memories of my children being in and around the opera, you know, walking in and out of dressing rooms backstage, being known by all the artists, sitting on the side of the stage underneath the stage manager's feet because yeah. they were so used to it that they trusted that they would sit there. Little fellas sitting there just watching It's amazing, the opera. isn't it? Because we should mention that Harrison, your son, is about... Well, he's already known as a... Quite, uh, quite well known as an actor in Australia, but everyone's got a fingers crossed for a movie that's about to be released. Yeah, later in the year, Fallen, yeah. uh, which is directed by Scott Hicks. That'll, yes. that'll come out later in the year. So we're all looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it too. I, your I son, The Fallen thinking. Angel. Yes, well, you know, he went to St Dominic's and uh, when, we, when we told one of the nuns that he was a fallen angel, she sort of went, oh, Lord, Lord. And uh, Julie that. said, well, he comes good. Oh, thank God for that. Julie's your wife, of course. <laughs> yeah. But um, one of the other things that you've managed to do in life is to the job, the job that everybody would envy, which is being that... I'm not sure what your official title is. Uh, event manager and uh, creative director of the... Pageant. Of the pageant, the Christmas pageant that everybody all around Australia has heard of, the pageant here in South Australia used to be from a department store here, but now the state government is more or less the godfather. Is yeah. that how it works? Yeah, when I, I got to a certain point where my children were going to school, and you really have to travel a lot to, to keep your singing career working. So um, this job came up, and it doesn't often come up. I think I'm the fifth director. So I applied for it, and they gave me the opportunity. And um, you know, it's an amazing thing. So what happened was John Martin's uh, um, sort of was taken over by um, David Jones. Uh, ultimately, the government to protect it in South Australia purchased the uh, the um, pageant, and then set about to get sponsors. And the credit unions came in uh, on this massive. Uh, well, thank goodness for that because sponsorship. it's so iconic here in a, in South Australia, and I guess almost. Yeah, I reckon everyone born in South Australia that's now alive would know that, first of all, John Martin's pageant. I remember as a small child sitting on my father's shoulder and then with the heat vomiting all over him, but that's another story, <laughs> uh, watching the pageant go past. Because uh, one of those funny things when you watch, when you're stationary and it's moving, is you think you're moving and it's stationary. Have you experienced that? Or is uh, that... Yeah, a little bit. Uh, there's so much that goes on on pageant day. Um, you know, you, you have a memory of it. Uh, you ask anybody in South Australia, they've probably ridden Nipper and Nimble. Yep. Uh, they've probably been to a pageant. Yep. They've probably gone to it many times as a child and then perhaps not gone to it and then come back and brought their it's, children Yeah, back. it's amazing. And even I had the great pleasure of, of so-called comparing it for television in a couple yep. of years. So, And Sue Barron, who also does this program, or Sue Cardwell now, but she was Sue Barron, yeah. then, she was co-hosting that. So we've all had a part of that. Brian... Uh, I'd love you to come back and talk more about the pageant because the story of the pageant and how it happens every year is such a major thing. So come back later in the year and tell sure. us more about the pageant. Would love to. And thanks so much. It's just so interesting hearing just this little tweak of um, your life. Pleasure. Janice, Malcolm. we've got to say goodbye to somebody. I know, our teddy bear. Yes. Well, that's what we call him. We've been calling him teddy bear for ages, but his <laughs> name is really Steve, and he's on camera two, and he's been 
just one of the best guys we've ever worked yes, with. Yes, we've enjoyed. Apart from the other boys that are here. All the but... banter immensely. Yes. <laughs> and what you don't always see is what he does while we're trying to talk to you and be serious. But, <laughs> Steve, we wish you all the best in your future career from now and forevermore. Thank you very much. Thank you from all of us, Steve. <laughs> Teddy. Teddy. And now, here is the lovely Dolly Lee. Hi, Dolly. Hello, Hello. Dolly. Hello. We've asked Dolly on the show because she's doing a tour here in South Australia of the Out of the Square Network of Suburban Theatres with a tribute show to... Linda Ronstead. Oh, I love Linda Why Ronstead. did you pick Linda? Um, I chose Linda because of my father took me to her concert when I was 14 years old. Was that the first one you'd seen? It was the first one I went to. Can you, can you let everybody know it starts in a very unusual way? It starts with me on roller skates because that's how Linda used to do her shows back in those days. So that means everybody now that does a show has to start on roller skates. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what are you singing for us now? Um, today I'm singing you a medley of three of her hits. Fantastic. Which are? Which are uh, You're No Good. Don't it's say so that to Janice, easy. she's a nice girl. <laughs> it's so easy. Oh, and don't talk about me you. like that either. Thank you very much. It's no hope for us here, I can tell you. <laughs> After that, she has to sing, Malcolm. Exactly. <laughs> so you can take it away. Dolly Lee, thank you. Thanks, thank you. Dolly. Bye, everyone. See you on Facebook. Feeling better now that we're through. Feeling better cause I'm over you I learned my lesson and left the scars Now I see how you really are You're no good, you're no good, you're no good Baby, you're no good I'm gonna say it again You're no good, you're no good, you're no good Baby, you're no good It's so easy to fall in love It's so easy to fall in love It's so easy to fall in love It's so easy So yeah, it's so goddamn easy Whoa, it seems so easy Yeah, where you're concerned My heart's to learn and well fall in love It's so easy to fall in love I feel so sad I got a worried mind I'm so lonesome all the time Since I left my baby behind on blue by you Saving nickels, saving dimes Waiting till the sun don't shine Looking forward to happier times Song blew by you